All right, so we are in a series entitled Emotions. You know, God has wired us with the ability to feel, and uh, that's a good thing. There are a whole gamut of emotions that we experience in life, uh, some of them great joy and, uh, and fun and love and all those great emotions. But then we also, in those difficult moments in our life, we also have emotions of sadness, of of discouragement and fear. Last week, I talked about fear and overcoming the emotion of fear in our life. So you can see how emotions can control our lives if we don't learn how to manage them. And this morning, I want to speak about this emotion. They say that this is one of the deepest emotions we can experience, one of the deepest negative emotions that we can experience, and that is the emotion of rejection. Rejection can create all sorts of barriers in our life. It literally can put you and I behind bars figuratively in our lives. I think if we're all honest today, we've all experienced rejection in our life. You know, it, it usually starts in the school playground. School playgrounds can be kind of mean. I remember being in those playgrounds and all the kids up against the fence and we were picking teams for our soccer game. You, have you ever been there? And, and the best players get chosen first and then the whatever is left kind of, you, you know, you guys take two and you take these other two. Aye. And then as we go to grow and become adults and There are all sorts of situations that can scream rejection to us. It could be related to our employment, when maybe uh, an annual review doesn't go so well, and all the things that we're not good at good at get surfaced. Sometimes you've even maybe lost a job because of your lack of performance, and there is that sting of rejection. Sometimes our greatest Emotion, when it's related to rejection, that has the greatest impact on us is when we're rejected by those that we love the most. That's where the sting is even deeper. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's from a child. Maybe it's from a sister or a brother or a parent. Just imagine, some of you have heard words from your very own parent that says, You don't belong here. We don't want you here. And that sting of rejection goes deep within our hearts, and we try to continue doing life, but boy, does that have an effect on us. And so we've got to somehow manage that emotion of rejection, because if we don't, it will have huge ramifications into our everyday life. This morning, I want us to start with this thought. Jesus understands rejection. Jesus was rejected. Jesus was not just rejected once or twice or three times over, but multiple times of deep-seated rejection was thrown his way. And so if you've come in here and you've had this sense, these feelings of rejection that are are maybe below the waterline of our lives, Jesus understands. He knows what it's like and he knows what it feels like to be relegated to the fringe. He knows what that's like. The reason why I can say that is because the Scriptures tell us and show us of some of the rejection. The prophet Isaiah foreshadowed this. He wrote, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. They covered their faces so much that they despised him. This is not just, you know, I I don't see eye to eye. Despising, rejected. Jesus understands what it feels like to be rejected. In Mark 8, 31, the scriptures say this. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. So Jesus himself knew that this would happen. And look at who would reject him. 
the ones who should have known better, the ones who knew the Pentateuch, the ones who, who were religious, who knew the word of the Lord, they were the ones that rejected him to the point of seeing to it that Jesus would be nailed to a cross. Talk about the sting of rejection that Jesus experienced. First Peter 2.4 re-highlights this for us. It says, as you come to him, the living stone, Jesus, whom was rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You see, the reality is all of us turned our back on God. It was because of our sin that he was nailed to the cross. It was because of our rejection of him that he died. Jesus understands what rejection feels like. And Jesus was not just rejected just once, but many times over. Let me give you some of those examples. There were times when Jesus would teach and many of his disciples, the ones who were following him from town to town, abandoned him. We see it in Mark 14. Listen to what it says. Then everyone deserted him and fled. Jesus, the Son of God, the King of kings, everyone deserted him, left him. It was soon after the Garden of Gethsemane. And look who's left around. With Jesus, in verse 51, it says, A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. How is discouraging? How discouraging is this? When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. So now there's Jesus. The only thing he's got is this garment from this young man, but everybody else deserted him. His disciples, the ones who said they believed in what he was saying, there were times where they left him and walked away. Talk about the sting of rejection. Of course, we see a friend's betrayal in the life of Jesus. And maybe you can understand this. Maybe you've experienced the betrayal of someone who you trusted and you believed in. You thought it was a safe relationship, but they betrayed you. Jesus knows what that's like. Judas, one of his very own 12, Kor, betrayed him in the Garden of Gethsemane so much so, so poignantly that he even kisses him on his cheek so as a signal to the enemies to arrest him. Talk about betrayal. Talk about rejection. Of course, a disciple's denial in the life of Peter. Peter, who had seen so much that God had done, so much Jesus has done, and yet dismisses, denies even knowing Jesus in one of the darkest hours of his life. You know your true friends, when things don't go so well in life, they stick to you. They stand with you amidst not only your victories, but your failures. Well, Jesus in those moments was left, was denied, was rejected, was betrayed, even the courts found him guilty of blasphemy. The religious leader bring him into a courtroom because they're saying, this guy says he's the son of God when really he isn't. That means blasphemy. He should be killed because of it. And we see this poignant moment in Jesus' life where in verses uh, 64 and 65 in Mark 14, it says they all condemned him as worthy of death. You know what? You know what worth you are? You're worthy to die is what you're worthy of, Jesus. And they go on, and then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, come on, Jesus, prophesy now. You say you're the son of God. We're going to blindfold you. Where's the punch coming from now, Jesus? Talk about rejection. Don't just skim through these passages. Jesus was also, yes, fully God, but he was fully man. He felt the sting of rejection. Of course, even the crowds cry for his crucifixion. See this in Mark 15. These crowds that were crying out to the leaders of the day, crucify him, crucify him, were the ones who just days earlier had said, Hosanna, we worship you. You're the king of kings. They were the same ones who a few days later cried out, crucify him. 
Talk about rejection. Talk about betrayal. Jesus knows what it feels like. Then, of course, the apex of his rejection, the crucifixion itself. As they nail him to a cross, they mock him with a sign above his head, King of the Jews. They, there was those passerbys as he was nailed there between two prisoners. The humiliation of Christ is the cross. Hurling insults at him in his darkest moment. Betrayal. Rejection. The very people he came to save. Rejected. The very people he healed. Rejected him. The very people he fed rejected him. The very people that followed him and saw all that he was about rejected him. And ultimately, that darkest moment when the Father himself has to turn his back away from all the sins that came upon his son's life. And in that moment, Jesus himself cries out, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Are you sensing the depth of rejection in our Jesus? It was our sin that caused him to go to the cross and be rejected by the human family so that you and I could have life. Friends, Jesus was not just rejected once, but many times over. And maybe you're sitting here and you could say, boy, I know what that's like. Jesus responds yet to the rejection he faces with these words, which are remarkable. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Feel the weight of those words this morning. Amidst all of the betrayal and rejection, Father, Forgive them, for they don't know what they do. See, friends, Jesus experienced rejection, so you and I can overcome rejection in our own lives. He thought and still thinks you are worth dying for, friend. You are worth purchasing with his own blood. Therefore, no one else has any right to condemn you or to question your significance. Not even you. You see, sometimes, yes, we... We, we, we hear words that tell us you're not significant, you're not worthy, you're not worth, you're not valuable, and we hear the opposite, you're useless, you'll never amount to anything, you're incompetent, you're inadequate for a variety of reasons. You don't have the right socioeconomic background, you don't look the look we're looking for, you don't have the abilities, you don't have the skill set. These words have been spoken into all of our lives at some point in a, in a variety of different ways. Friend, you are worth something. You are worth something so much so that he died for you. Don't allow other people's words to devalue God's greatest treasure. Don't even do it to yourself. You see, sometimes we dismiss ourselves and we speak words of negativity over our lives and we say, I'm useless. They're right, I'll never amount to anything. I always am at the back end of the road. I'll never reach any dream. I'll never get where I feel God's called me to go. Never good enough. Don't allow yourself to be the barrier to what God speaks into your life. And so this morning, I want to share three truths to overcoming, conquering the bondage of rejection because that's what it is. It's a bondage. It will tie you up. The evil one salivates over rejection when they're spoken over our lives because he wants to paralyze you. He wants to imprison you so that you don't accomplish anything, so that you don't feel like you're worth anything, so that you don't do much for God. And there's nothing further than the truth than that. The first thought I want you to consider in overcoming this is this. You belong through God's adoption. The word belong is really important. You see, when we're rejected, there's a sense where you don't belong. You're not good enough. You are relegated to the fringes of our society, to the fringes of our peer group, 
to the fringes of our church, to the fringes of our society, to the fringe because of your socioeconomic background, because of the color of your skin, because of your lack of education, whatever it is, you don't belong. And maybe you've heard it even said to you, or maybe you've felt it, that you don't belong. Well, I want you to know that you do belong. In fact, you are adopted into the family of God. I want you to listen to these words of Scripture. But when the set time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are His sons and daughters, God sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. The Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. God put the spirit in you of sonship, daughtership. You are part of the family of God. You are adopted into the family of God where you can say, hey, Dad, Papa. That's the original language. There's that intimate feel in that moment. Abba, Father. It's not a distant father. It's an intimate father. It's the kind of relationship where you, a son, daughter, climb up on your father's lap because it's safe there. There's affirmation there. There's acceptance there. You belong there. So when we experience rejection, even from our very own family, know this, you belong to the family of God. You're adopted into the family of God. And you can say this morning, Abba, Father, I worship you. I'm safe and secure with you because I belong to you. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. Receive that this morning. In your, in your painful experiences of rejection, don't allow, or allow yourself to be labeled as orphan. You are not an orphan. You are a son and daughter of the Most High God. You belong. You belong. You see, you must embrace this as a fact for your life. The Father loves you and rejoices in calling you His Son. He loves you, and He rejoices in the fact that he can call you son and daughter. He's not ashamed to call you his kids. These are two of my boys here. I am so proud of these kids. I love these kids. I love talking about how amazing they are, how unique they are, their abilities. God has crafted them. You might say, boy, I, I don't have an earthly father like that. I don't have parents or people in my family. In fact, sometimes I feel like I'm actually despised by them. Listen, the voice of the Father speaks today to you and says, I'm so pumped you're my kid. Oh, man. And I am not ashamed, but man, I just, I love you so much. If you want to sum up the whole Bible, it's this. Jesus loves you. He loves you. So when others don't love you, don't let that mess you up because Jesus loves you tremendously. He loves calling you his own. Christ sacrificed everything so you could spend eternity with him because he could not bear to be parted from you. Romans talks about that. Think about that. So when you have felt like you're a bother to people, like, you kind of feel like, ah, they don't like you around. I wish you were somewhere else. Listen, replace those feelings with this spiritual truth. God wants you around so much so that he died on a cross because just the thought of being separated from you for eternity messes him up. He wants to spend eternity with you because you're the apple of his eye. He wants to be where you are. Absolutely nothing can separate you from the love of God, friend. Nothing. Or remove you from the sovereign hand of God. This is important. Notice this text, John 10, 27, 29. i got to read it to you. Here's the heart of Christ for your life. My sheep, Jesus says, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. 
I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. And get this, no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Nothing can snatch you out of your Father's hands. He knows you intimately. You because you belong to the family of God. We are adopted in the family of God. So when you don't feel like you belong, because we've all been there, sometimes even in church settings, there could be the sting of feeling you don't belong. Friend, we will continue to work relentlessly to make sure that that never happens. But it is destined to happen because we're made of imperfect people. And when those feelings come where I don't belong, don't allow that thought to reign in your heart. Don't allow it to put you in bondage behind bars because the truth is you do belong. You're part of the family of God and you have a father who you can call Papa. And he has a plan and a purpose for your life. The second spiritual truth in conquering rejection over our life is this. You find your worth through a relationship with Christ. We find our worth, our value. All of us wants to feel, we all want to feel valuable. We all want to feel like we're contributing something. But sometimes somebody or something or some situation has made us feel like we're not worth it. But I want you to know that you are. You see, sometimes we look at our faults, we look at our imperfections, we look at our failures and wonder how others could possibly care about us. It's amazing. There could be, <laughs> I've experienced this in my life so many times, so many encouraging words spoken to you, and then there's that one pierce, that word of negativity that just comes at you and stings you. And all of a sudden, all the 10 words of edification and encouragement just kind of dissipate. Do you find that? And all of a sudden, that one experience that was negative resounds. It's like a clanging cymbal in your head. And you start thinking about your imperfections or maybe your inadequacy or your lack of skill. And maybe they're right. And maybe, maybe I shouldn't even do this anymore. <laughs> maybe I should just throw in the towel. We have worth in our relationship with Christ not in the outcome of other people's opinion. We find our worth and our value in Christ. You see, there's an amazing passage in Romans chapter 8, and I want you to let these words just bathe you this morning. If God is for us, who is against us? Think about this. He who did not spare his very own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Now follow this. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who will bring a, an evaluation that says worthless, incompetent, inadequate? Who will do that? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. God is for you. Though there are those that are against you, God is for you. The one who created you, the one who, who is in a position to give judgment because he's your creator, is the one who says, worthy, saint, daughter, son. Warrior, called one, gifted, adequate, purpose-driven. His words need to resound in our life. We find our worth in our relationship with Christ. And then to top it all off, the Scriptures tell us He even sits and intercedes for us. 
The Spirit intercedes for Joel. Come on, Joel. I've got a purpose and a plan for your life. Come on, Joel. Keep trusting me. He's praying for you because you're the apple of his eye. You're the apex of his creation. You belong to him and you find your worth in him. You see, the one person with the authority to judge your value, who owns and rules everything in all creation, made this eternal assessment of you. You are worth dying for. Receive that. You are worth dying for. You are worth dying for. Somebody has told you you're not worthy, you're not worth their time. They don't want to bother with you. You are worth dying for. See, there are biblical truths that point to our worth. Did you know that? I want, I'm going to rattle off a bunch of truths. And you got to keep saying and believing and standing on these truths in your life. Here's truth number one. You are the Lord's heir and co-heir with Christ, period. Here's another one. You are a temple of the living God. Listen to that. God has chosen to live in you. He wants to reside in you. He wants his postal code to be you. He puts his spirit in you. He wants to be not only with you, but in you. Think about that truth. You are conformed to Christ's matchless likeness. You are an image bearer of the Lord. You know, your kids, if you have children, they probably resemble you or your spouse or a mixture of both. We are created in the image of God. There, we have the fingerprints of God in our life. Anything that has the fingerprints of God in their life is worthy to be respected and treated with dignity. Here's another truth. You are unconditionally loved. Receive it. No matter all your victories or all of your defeats, God has already made a decision. He's going to love you all the way through. Whether you perform well or whether you don't, you're unconditionally loved. Though others put conditions on their love over your life, God doesn't. He's unconditional. Here's another truth. You are liberated from all condemnation. Stop condemning yourself because Jesus has. Here's another truth. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and God's own possession. Boy, does our world need that. We are the human family, <laughs> chosen by God, treasured. We're his treasured possession, which means we should probably treat each other with care, with respect, with dignity, because we're all his. Hey, if you mess with one of my kids, watch out. I'll do it tactfully, but I'll do it, right? Because they're my kids, right? Come on, dads, moms, you know what that's like. Well, you're his kids, and we better be treating each other with utmost respect and love and care and gentleness, not with disregard and disrespect and, and without any dignity. That gets God mad. You are God's handiwork created for good works. You're God's handiwork. He created you intricately, delicately, exactly the way he wanted you to, to be created. You might say, man, he didn't have a good day that day. Because when I compare myself with other people's skills and abilities, I just feel like I just got the, the back end of the day. Maybe it was at the end of his shift. I don't look a certain way. I don't have certain abilities. I don't have certain skills. 
Stop. You are God's handiwork. God doesn't make mistakes. We might have things that hinder us, maybe physical challenges, emotional challenges, learning disabilities, whatever it is. Oh, God loves, you are his handiwork. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. Moses stuttered. He he had a difficulty speaking. And that was one of the excuses he he told God. God, you can't call me to be a leader. I, I, I stutter. God says, no, no, no. I've called you with all your inabilities and weaknesses and all that, and you will see what I will do through you. None of us have a right to dismiss somebody else because we're all God's handiwork. You have a home in heaven. Think about that. Sometimes we feel like, man, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not at a certain level because I don't own a certain home or drive a certain car or have a car at all or, or whatever. And we put this pressure to think, to think to ourselves, I'll feel more valuable once I have all those things. God says, forget all this stuff. It'll burn. It'll rot. You have a home in heaven waiting for you. You have a secure future. Your name is written permanently in his book of life. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Can somebody say thank you, Jesus, to that? Some people will blot you off. Get that name off the roll call, off the staff, off this, off that. Not good enough. God says they're good enough. (laughs) They're right here etched in the book of life, and one day they'll be with me forever with no more of this stuff. (laughs) So when you face rejection, hey, it's not the end of the story. Not the end of the story. Thirdly, here's my final point. How to conquer rejection in our life. You are competent through the Holy Spirit. You see, sometimes part of the sting of rejection is somebody has concluded you're not competent enough. You ever been there? And it's not just for our kids, but it's As adults, we deal with this. Just yesterday, I was texting back and forth with a good friend of mine who is from another city, and he started a whole new career, and and he was feeling incompetent. And there was those around him that are telling him he's incompetent. And he had to just talk to a friend. And we had to go back to the word of the Lord and say, wait a minute, there's a Holy Spirit who actually has chosen to live in us, and he gives us gifts and abilities that far outweigh our inadequacies. (laughs) All at times we struggle with rejection because someone has concluded or has made us feel we are incapable of performing as he or she expects us to perform. I've come to the realization that there, there will always be somebody that you'll never reach their expectations. And because of that, they will make a conclusion that's probably a negative conclusion about you. It is during these seeming failing or failures in our life, the evil one lies to paralyze us. The scripture calls the devil the father of lies. When somebody has made us feel, or maybe we've, we've just concluded ourselves that we're inadequate or incompetent for whatever reason, not prepared for the task at hand, we're in a vulnerable position there in that moment. You lose a job, you're in a vulnerable p- position. And it's in that vulnerable position where the evil one then creeps around you, and you know what he does? He starts throwing lies into your life. And you know what the lies sound like? Here's one. There's absolutely no way you can handle such a terribly immense challenge. There's no way you're going to get through this. This thing's going to kill you. This thing is going to bury you. But the truth is this. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. (laughs) You need to say that sometimes. You actually need to get into your prayer closet. Wait a minute. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can't do them on my own, but I sure can do them with him. 
Here's another lie he throws into our life. I feel so inadequate and inferior. You ever felt that way? Anybody? I, this is, church is part, confession is part of church life. You ever feel inadequate? Inferior? We all feel that. I, I'm, I, as a leader, as your pastor, I try to be as transparent as possible, sometimes too transparent. But the reason why is because I want you to feel like you can be transparent around Heartland. You can be yourself, all the good stuff, but also the times where you just feel inadequate and you feel inferior to others. But here's the truth to this lie. Our adequacy is from God, the Scripture says, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Here's another lie that comes our way. I'm useless. When I hear that word in my home, we stop everything. And we have a little conversation. You're not useless. You may not be good at that. And maybe it's clarity to say maybe you should focus on something else, but you're not useless. Because the scriptures tell us to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That means every Christ follower has been given gifts and abilities to accomplish great things. Every single one of us. Now, we got to do some work in trying to discover those gifts and those abilities and then positioning our life to, 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 to deploy those gifts. You're not going to be good at everything, but you're definitely not useless because the Spirit promises He's given you gifts. It's another lie. No wonder people forget I exist. Especially when you've missed the mark, you've fumbled the ball. <laughs> Maybe in your company you've made a mistake and it's costed them thousands of dollars. No wonder people forget I exist. Or maybe you're socially awkward and you know it and you're like, here's the truth. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Paul received that today. Have you heard this slide before? I have no one I can count on. Oh, this one's good. I have nobody I can count on. Every time I try to count on somebody, that they never follow through. I, truth is, I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in that. I rest in that safety. Come on. How about this one? No one will help me. No one ever wants to help me. Friend, the truth is this. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear. We need to barge our prayer closet and say, God, help me. Oh, and he'll help you, friend. Oh, he'll help you through all kinds of complicated situations, all kinds of discouragement. Here's a final lie. I have no one I can trust. Who has said that before? Nobody's raising their hand on that one. I have no one I can trust, especially when you have just come out of a betrayal or, or somebody just really hurts you. The truth is this. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart exalts. And with my song, I shall praise you. Your competency comes from the Spirit of God. And in those moments of vulnerability, don't allow the evil one to handcuff you and put you behind bars and paralyze you from accomplishing great things for God. Charles Stanley said this, Rejection is a difficult wound to heal but it is often made much worse if you insist on winning the approval of the people who don't care about you. So 
somebody needs to hear this. You've been living your life to try to get the approval of somebody who simply doesn't care. Instead of resting in the acceptance of Christ. I conclude with this as the team comes. I'm still profoundly impacted by the words of my Jesus who says, amidst all of his rejection, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. I'm profoundly impacted by that phrase. It takes a level of maturity in the face of rejection to still be a loving person, to repay evil with good, to be kind, to come to the place where we can say, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Instead of repaying evil with evil, as our world does, watch the news. May we have a depth and a security in Christ that is enabling us to say, Father, I release that to you. Forgive them, for they do not know what they do. You see, friend, we all have the opportunity to turn rejection around and turn it into the healing power of love. Stop analyzing whether or not people are rejecting you and make it your goal to show the love of God to whomever you meet. Remember, everybody is created in the image of God. We are all image bearers of the Lord. So, maybe you walked in with a bit of sting in your life. Friend, you belong. Don't believe the lie that says you don't belong. You're adopted in the family of God. Maybe you've come and said, I'm not worth it. You are worth it. Jesus died for you because you're worth it. Maybe you have walked in feeling incompetent. Your competence comes from the Spirit today. And may I challenge us as a congregation, knowing the deep wounds that rejection can create in somebody's life, Let's be that kind of community that builds, encourages, watches what we speak. Because our wor words can either be healing or our words can actually create pain in people's lives. Rest in knowing you belong to God today. Would you stand with us?